Acts of foreign interference attack the fairness of the electoral process and must be addressed to protect our democracy. When I appeared on November 1st, I spoke of the importance of a whole-of-government approach. I would add that political parties, electoral district associations, and local campaigns also have a crucial role to play. Foreign interference is conducted through a range of tactics, and countering those tactics re requires an array of measures, both legislative and non-legislative. Several suggestions have been made within and outside of this committee. None of them, including recommendations that I have made, provide a full and complete answer. We cannot totally shield ourselves from foreign interference, especially in an open and free society, but we can and we must increase our resiliency. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Monsieur Perrault. Madame Simard. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je vous remercie de me recevoir à nouveau à ce comité. À titre de commissaire, to appear before the committee again today. As Commissioner of Canada Elections, I take the issue of foreign interference in our elections very seriously. The Canada Elections Act defines the scope of my mandate and covers very specific activities related to foreign interference. The role is complementary to others who play a key role in protecting our democracy and with whom we collaborate. Since my last appearance on November 1st, additional allegations of foreign interference have circulated in the public environment and have led to complaints to my office. I am seized with the importance of this issue, as well as the need to reassure Canadians under these exceptional circumstances. I would therefore like to inform you that we have conducted a rigorous and thorough review of every complaint and every piece of information that has been brought to our attention concerning allegations of foreign interference in both the 2019 and 2021 general elections. I can also confirm that this review is ongoing as I speak to determine whether there's any tangible evidence of wrongdoing under the Canada Elections Act. This work is being conducted impartially and independently from the government of the day, the public service, and even the chief electoral officer. I note that the outcome of this work will allow me to determine whether the allegations have merit under our act. They will not permit me to draw conclusions about the validity of election results overall, or in a particular writing. For reasons of confidentiality, I will not be able to provide further details regarding the ongoing review, complaints, or any, or any other information received by my office. As with any investigative body, confidentiality is essential to protect the presumption of innocence and of course, to avoid compromising the integrity of our work. I would, however, invite anyone who has tangible information about potential wrongdoing under the Canada Elections Act, including any attempt at foreign interference in a federal election, to contact my office. I would be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Madame Sima. And so now we will get into six minute question and answer rounds um, or question comment, however you want to do them. Um, and we will start with Mr. Cooper, followed by Mrs. Sahoda, et puis Madame Normandin, suivi par Mr. Julian. Six minutes à chacun. Everyone has six minutes. Mr. Cooper, à vous la parole. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for being here. Uh, Commissioner Samard, it's really simple. When did the Prime Minister's office contact you about Beijing's interference in the 2019 and 2021 elections so that investigations could be opened? So, thank you, Madam Chair, for that question. As I indicated in my opening remarks, the information surrounding the work that we're doing is protected by confidentiality, and so I can't provide you with that information. Did the Prime Minister's office contact you, and on what date? Yes or no? 
Once again, Madam Chair, I have to give the same answer. Okay. Confidentiality requires. I'm not going to answer that. That's fine. So, uh, you said you said that there have been complaints that have been provided to Elections Canada. How many? And do they pertain to Beijing's interference in our elections? Yes or no? Well, first of all, Madam Chair, I would point out that the complaints come to my office, to the com office of the commissioner, and not to the chief electoral officer. So I will speak on behalf of my organization, the officer of the uh, the office of the commissioner of Canada Elections. So uh, we did receive complaints. I won't repeat the information that I've already given. I have already provided the information on the number of complaints. For situations, there were 158 complaints. Four complaints? No. No, 158 complaints concerning the 2019 election dealing with 10 situations. For the 2021 election, 16 complaints regarding 13 situations. How many complaints have been brought forward, or my question, if, I did, if it wasn't clear, how many complaints have been brought forward uh, since you last appeared here, and are they related to Beijing's election interference? Thank you. So those files have been dealt with, but to re respond to that question, we have received two complaints that are in the public domain, and I can confirm that today. But for confidentiality reasons, I can't go further with my answer. I. Uh, provide as much information as I can for Canadians, and so I can tell you. Mr. Perot, uh, did you say, uh, so I see clarification uh, that I understood you correctly, that uh, the information that is contained in the Globe and Mail uh, report has not, that information, uh, no one has shared contents of that report uh, with Elections Canada? That is correct. Any information that, on the face of it, may uh, relate to a possible offense under the Canada Elections Act would normally flow directly to the commissioner. So we have, so is what you're saying, okay, to the commissioner, is that information, contents of the allegations contained in the Globe and Mail report been shared with Elections Canada, with, with your office? If I understand your question correctly, do I provide the information that I get with Elections Canada? If so, the answer is no. All the information that I receive is dealt with confidentially, and I act. Look, journalists have found, uh, they've reviewed CSIS documents that indicate that there was interference in the 2019 and 2021 elections. Why does Elections Canada not have that information? If journalists have that information, why don't you? Is the question to me? To whoever. Well, it's a, that, I think that is the question to be asked to the sources of the journalists, Madam Chair. So are you saying to me that CSIS has not provided Elections Canada with any information about interference in the 2019 or 21 elections? You don't have any information? We, we have been working with security agencies. We understand the security environment. We, there are known risks and known threats regarding foreign interference. This is not news, but in terms of specific uh, elements, factual elements, they have not shared that with me. As have I you said, asked for it? Any matters that relates with compliance to rules in the Canada Elections Has Act. Has Ms. Samard asked for it? Madam Chair, to answer the question, we have uh, agreements with CSIS that involve sharing of information and also assistance where required. The same kind of memorandum of understanding with the RCMP as well. Those are MOUs, 
and those involve information sharing. So once again, I would have to say that this is covered by confidentiality. So, uh, how, so you can't say, you won't say. Well, pardon, how much time? <laughs> Here we go. Excellent. Um, thank you for that exchange. Just a reminder that if there's two people speaking on the mic at the same time, the interpreters have to pick a language. And so there's many people, I'm sure, who are interested in this. Um, so I would just be mindful of making sure one person is speaking at a time. Mrs. Sahoda, up to six minutes for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, going off of what we were, the in previous interactions just now, I wanted to ask the Chief Electoral Officer and the Commissioner whether their testimony today, um, whether what they can say today, I guess, in their testimony uh, would be any different than what they would be able to reveal at a public inquiry. Madam Chair, as far as I'm concerned, I have to, it's, for me, it's either one or the other is the same thing. And the Commissioner? Yes, I would say the same thing. Okay, um, then I'm going to move on to um, the Canada Elections Act. So there have been some changes previously made by the current government uh, in C-76, uh, where uh, there were measures uh, introduced in legislation to keep out foreign influ uh, influence, including money in our elections. And I was wondering if uh, I could start with Mr. Perot, if you could explain a little bit of what of what those changes were that were implemented by the current government. So the main, uh, Madam Chair, the main rule that I can speak to is related to what is called undue influence by foreigners in the in the act, and that relates to a prohibition of uh, of in incurring any expense during the uh, election period to promote or oppose a candidate or a party. There are exceptions for uh, personal opinion or for, for media, for example. Uh, this is a, a, a restriction which applies only during the election period. And in my recommendation uh, to Parliament, I've suggested that it be extended beyond uh, that period. There is also a, a significant review of third party uh, uh, funding uh, regime um, that was not specifically uh, aimed at foreign interference, but there were aspects of the regime that do target that. Also there, I have made some recommendations to Parliament uh, to uh, reinforce those rules in terms of how third parties may use the, their own funds uh, for regulated activities and how this could allow foreign funding to penetrate our system. So I have made some recommendations uh, in that regard. Okay. Um, were there additional powers that were provided to the commissioner through that piece of legislation through the Canada Elections Act implemented by the current government? Well, yes, there were administrative powers that were provided for monetary sanctions added. That said, Although that's a good start, we have already talked about whether there are improvements needed. Uh, right now, I have to use uh, criminal powers to do my work. And so we don't have specific powers in the administrative area. Uh, of course, uh, we are talking about uh, foreign interference uh, clearly Th we have certain powers but we don't have certain other powers like uh, the ability to summon witnesses and uh, force production of papers and the monetary sanctions are very much inadequate uh, and so would they're just operating costs for those that are involved so in certain circumstances, these are very light penalties. So those are some measures that have been taken, but it would be important to add other powers as well. Thank you. And I think 
that is something that this committee can definitely recommend uh, doing since we are all interested in making sure that the integrity of our elections is um, kept strong. Uh, you had mentioned a little while ago a mechanism uh, for a, mem a memorandum, I think, believe of understanding a memorandum of understanding, perhaps, is what you had referred to, um, that is in place for Elections Canada to receive information. You just mentioned now that uh, you have to use criminal powers in order to um, compel or investigate uh, any further or lay charges or penalties. Um, you said that you have a relationship with CSIS through this memorandum of understanding and with the RCMP. Can you elaborate a little bit as to how that cooperation works? First of all, I would like to clarify that those memorandums of understanding, the MOUs, were established long before this, these allegations of foreign interference came up. So they are being reinforced. And I think other memorandums of understanding might be needed in the future. But I want to point out that it is very important to collaborate, and certainly our partners can count on our full cooperation where CSIS and RCMP are concerned. They have told us the same thing. And this question is to the commissioner specifically. Have you found uh, that through the investigations that you're currently uh, undertaking right now that CSIS and RCMP has been bringing you uh, information in order for you to undertake those investigations? I as I explained, I can't talk about the specific information, but I can confirm that we have a good partnership and we receive information as needed. Thank you. And now we go to Ms. Normandin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you but to both our witnesses for being here. Uh, talking first about the background, we found that uh, we, uh, we see from the media that there has been uh, interference by the Chinese consul consulate, and there was a recommendation that uh, one candidate be withdrawn, but the answer was that this didn't come under CSIS's powers to recommend that. So I would like to know whether the whether Elections Canada or the Commissioner's Office can provide that kind of recommendation if there is evidence of interference. I had that information, and this is a hypothesis, uh, because really this should come from CSIS and not from me, the answer to your question. But uh, the commissioner, well, once again, this information sharing can be done from my end side to theirs and vice versa. And I would say that, once again, uh, publicly, what comes out of all that is if we had a hypothetical situation like that, then it, uh, what I understand is that if there is evidence that a candidate is uh, the subject of foreign interference, neither of you could make a recommendations, recommendation to withdraw that ca candidate. What we can do is to make sure that the law is applied and it does not include the possibility to make that kind of recommendation. Mr. Perrault, the rules for nominations come under party authority, and so if there was a problem, it would be up to CSIS to get involved. To your knowledge, is there anyone other than a party that can recommend withdrawal of a candidate who might be the subject of foreign interference? 
I don't know anyone who has that authority. When you are informed about possible problems, uh, then do you usually have the information enough ahead of time so that you can make the adjustment, uh, make the adjustments, or uh, confirm that there is in fact uh, improper behavior? How does that work? Well, as someone who makes sure that the law is properly informed, applied, then this is a role that we play through my office. But once again, I have a very specific type of power, which is to bring charges under the criminal code. So that is how I can carry out my work and to take those official types of processes. Is there the possibility to uh, make this these allegations public? We have requirements that keep information from being made public, but are there ways for either of you to make these allegations public? Well, I just want to be clear that Confidentially, confidentiality applies not only to us, but also all the other organizations involved because we have to presume innocence and not compromise investigations. So once again, the work is done behind the scenes and there is a high concern for confidentiality, because those are the rights that people have. But if there is a potential charge against a candidate, the candidate would be informed, would he or she not? Yes, hypothetically, if there was an investigation, I would think that there would be uh, witnesses and, well, I would imagine that if there were charges laid, then would, then would national security be taken into account when laying those kind of charges? Well, my decisions are independent of what government is in power and my colleagues as well. So they come under the act. So there could not be a pretext used to keep, if information can't be made public, then the charges might not be laid for that reason. Thank you very much. Um, and now, Mr. Julian, six minutes to yourself. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you, Ms. Perrault and Mr. Perrault and Ms. Sima. You work every day to protect our election process, uh, and we really appreciate that. Your work is important. I know that you can't take a position, but the former chief electoral officer also called for a public inquiry regarding China's foreign interference in our elections. I know you can't make a comment on this, but there is definitely momentum for calling a public inquiry. Asking the questions around the nomination process, it is true that uh, the nomination process Elections Canada does not interfere with, but every candidate for nomination does have to file expense claims uh, and file a full and comprehensive review of contributions they've received. Uh, in that case, uh, for a nomination, if, for example, a bus was rented to transport people to a nomination meeting, should that have been included in the nomination expense declaration? So to be clear, Madam Chair, uh, not all nomination contestants have the obligation to file a financial return. Those that have spent or received more than $1,000 do have to file that return. Uh, if there is a 
goes specifically to the question, if a campaign, if a nomination contestant, sorry, um, uh, needs to file a return and has incurred expenses to promote his or her nomination, then that should be in, in the return, including the, the bus that you refer to. Okay, and in that in that same note then, if somebody else paid for that bus to transport people to a nomination meeting, that contribution in kind is governed by what rules? What are the limits and how is that declared? Contributions, whether in kind or, or, or monetary, are governed essentially by the same rules. They are subject to the same limits and are uh, subject to the same disclosure requirements. So if uh, somebody rented uh, a number of buses and the cost was over $1,600, for example, or over $1,700, uh, and uh, that was declared as a contribution in kind, somebody else paid for it, uh, would that be a violation of the Elections Act? A, a contribution in kind or, or financial that is above the uh, $1,600 limit um, would be a violation of the Act, yes. Could a contribution in kind come from somebody who is not a Canadian citizen or not a Canadian resident? Uh, it has to come from a citizen or a permanent resident. And and so any anyone else paying for that contribution in kind would also uh, constitute a violation of the Elections Act? It would. If uh, somebody made a contribution, they were a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, and they made a contribution and that money was reimbursed to them, but they were still given the credit and the tax uh, receipt for the contribution. Is that a violation of the Canada's Elections Act? That would be a violation. Um, there are many scenarios around that, but essentially if a contribution is returned, it's not a true contribution and there are, there are uh, violations around that scenario. Okay, so th these are all cases uh, that could be violations. So if a complaint was issued even after the fact uh, for a filing of a nomination candidate or for a candidate in the elections, uh, that is, is that not something that Elections Canada would refer to the Commissioner of Elections? If there was a, a factual element to the complaint, if there's any uh, basis to, to refer that to the Commissioner, yes, we would. It, 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 you would investigate it initially, you would look at the candidate's return or the candidate's nomination return, and if you see discrepancies or if the complaint touches on things that have not been declared within those, uh, within those declarations, uh, you, would, you would be investigating it and then referring it to the Commissioner of Elections? We would use that information as part of the audit, inform the audit, but depending on the nature of the information uh, and what we find in the audit, uh, if there's any uh, potential violation, we don't make that determination. If there's a possible violation of the Act, then it is referred to the Commissioner. It is her decision alone to decide how to deal with the matter. This can happen even if somebody has done their expense declaration and it's been accepted by Elections Canada, you can reopen a file if there is new information that comes. Well, if an audit file is closed, it doesn't mean that all is clear forever. It just means that it has been reviewed and it is closed. But if there is new information that affects the file, it can be reopened or it can be sent to the commissioner's office. I would now like to talk about offenses and violations. Uh, for example, we had a situation where Dan Miastro was found guilty. And uh, tell me about that situation and the violations. It might be useful. My office prepared a whole description that might be able to answer your questions. Uh, so we have the list of penalties 
compared with the the yes. different types of and now we will start issues. With the Thank you. Five minute rounds by Mr. Cooper, followed by Mr. Turnbull. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be splitting my time with Mr. Bertold. Um, would it violate the Canada Elections Act to funnel money through proxies to a nomination or election candidate? Well, the directed contributions are illegal. illegal. Thank you. Would it violate the Canada Elections Act for a business to hire an individual under the pretense that the individual work for that business and then pay that individual to work on a political campaign? Yes. That, that would amount to an illegal uh, contribution, non-monetary contribution by the business. Thank you. Would it violate the Canada Elections Act for consular officials or staff at a foreign consulate or embassy to assist a candidate for a campaign during work hours? Um, it would, there are rules on volunteer uh, labor, and I'd have to verify the specifics on that. Okay, thank you for that. And with respect to uh, the penalties uh, that would uh, apply, could you elaborate briefly on those with respect to those uh, to, to a circumstances in which you had identified as uh, contravening the Act? Well, as I explained, Madam Chair, I have this table that indicates the violations. So we have to make a distinction between violations that have monetary or actual criminal sanctions. Thank you, Mr. Perrault. You, will you provide that information? Uh, yes, uh, we just want to make sure that we get all the information. Thank you. Mr. Perrault, have you had any meetings uh, with a minister or anyone else regarding Beijing's political or rather interference in elections? Has anyone from the government tried to communicate with you, to advise you, to ask you for information, or to ask you to find solutions to this issue, which is increasing. And we have heard a number of times that this is a problem that <clears throat> is quite uh, uh, predominant right now. We work with our security partners. We work with uh, CSIS and others, uh, RCMP and CSC, for in some cases to do tabletop exercises, but it hasn't been an important enough issue for the Prime Minister to contact your office. No. <laughs> Have you all the uh, authorities that you need to deal with CSIS? Yes. So are there things that CSIS tells you that you can't share with MPs right now? I don't have factual information about foreign interference. I deal with the risks that are present before the elections. So you haven't had any discussion with the PMO or with the prime minister for any changes to make or legislative changes needed to deal with the f interference of this type. My recommendations to parliament were provided in June of last year. I provided a number of recommendations, and there are ideas on the table. Uh, have you had any answers? The committee has to look at the recommendations that I proposed, and uh, I will wait for that. Ms. Sima, you said in your opening remarks that the there were 16 complaints um, regarding 13 situations and that all those files were closed? As I mentioned earlier, yes. In the briefing that Mr. Perrault received uh, that was made public yesterday, I believe, we understand that Mr. Perrault referred three complaints to the commissioner, to you, 
were those three complaints that were considered to be of concern to the chief electoral officer, were they investigated? Uh, Madam Chair, I would ask for more clarification because we get thousand, uh, thousands of complaints a year, thousand in 2022. The three that were provided to you, referred to you by the Chief Electoral Office, uh, Chief by Elections Canada. I'm afraid I don't know which complaints those are. Thank you. Mr. Turnbull? Up to five minutes for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so thank you for uh, the witness for being here today. Um, so I want to uh, just clarify. So here are the, some things that I've heard, and I just want to recap. So the RCMP is responsible for investigating instance, in, incidents of foreign actor interference across Canada, and they do so based on information from their own intelligence and partner agencies. And the Commissioner of Elections is responsible for ensuring compliance with and enforcement of the Canada Elections Act. And you, Ms. Samara, do so based on your own investigative work, as well as the intelligence provided by partner uh, agencies and departments. And both these two functions, the RCMP and the Commissioner of Elections, make independent decisions on whether to investigate based on complaints or information received. Would you say that that's true? Well, generally speaking, that is the situation, yes. Thank you. And um, so we've seen, um, you know, circulating in the media reports that CSIS allegedly became aware of instances where the difference between the original political contribution and the refund a person gets at tax time was returned to donors. Uh, can you confirm, Ms. Samar, that that would be a contravention of the Canada Elections Act? Well, once again, this is a hypothetical scenario, and in that context, I can say that there are measures in the Canada Elections Act that could apply to that. Great. And uh, what about the other uh, CSIS, uh, the report that CSIS allegedly found, which is that uh, um, business owners hired international Chinese students and assigned them to volunteer in electoral campaigns on a full-time basis. Is that also in contravention of the Canada Elections Act? Once again, that is a hypothetical scenario and for the under the financing provisions, there may be measures that apply and that would be under the Canada Elections Act, yes. Okay, great. And um, you, as being the commissioner, have the authority to investigate those types of matters. Is that correct? Yes. My power is defined in the Elections Act. I apply the act. Sorry, I, I just, I'm short answer question, sorry. Um, if CSIS became aware of illegal activity, would you expect that them to hand that over to you for a, for an investigation to take place in appropriate action? Mon uh, yeah. My expectation regarding my partner agency is for them to provide me information as soon as they receive it anything that might involve a violation of the Canada Elections Act, it should be communicated to me without an assessment on their part. And that action, if there is action taken as a result of an investigation, would that be made public? The investigations are confidential, confidential for the reasons that I mentioned, and if official steps are taken, then the certain information would be communicated. And within Bill C-76, you were given new powers and authorities to compel testimony by applying to a judge uh, uh, to have uh, individuals um, basically be compelled under oath to, um, to um, testify on, on these matters. Is that not correct? 
I would say that, generally speaking, that is the case, but I could provide more clarification on that. But overall, uh, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. No more questions. Thank you, Mr. Turnbull. Madame Normandie? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Since the beginning of this questioning, we have heard a number of examples raised, and you have said that hypothetically, given the possible violations of the Canada Action Elections Act, there could be action taken. And uh, when we talked about uh, partnering, you said that you would get information from the other agencies, the CSIS and RCMP, and you would act on them. So if there was any possibility of foreign interference. But yesterday, we heard that the system, as it exists, prevents foreign interference. But I haven't heard that from you. So what prevents either the chief electoral officer or the commissioner? Uh, what prevents you from actually taking action ahead of time? Well, one of the constraints is that we live in a free and open society, and that is a very good thing. We can say what we want on the social media. We can go to the bank and withdraw money and spend it how we like without surveillance. So when we live in an open society, there are risks that foreign governments take advantage of that. So we don't want measures that would involve actual surveillance of Canadians. But we do want to make Canadians aware. We want to work with government parties, riding associations to make sure that we build resilience in Canada, but there is no mechanism to prevent problems. But when information is provided that a foreign power is interfering and favoring a given candidate, uh, you can't take an ac action? Well, I don't know exactly what situation you're talking about or, about or whether there is concrete information. So uh, it's very difficult, Madam Chair, to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Perrault and Ms. Sima, there is information that raises the question of foreign interference. And if I understand correctly, this is not enough for a file to be open or for a recommendation be, to be made for withdrawing a candidate or overturning a nomination. So working with CSIS or if there is a public complaint, is that enough to be able to look at the declarations provided again to make sure that there have been no of violations of the Canada Elections Act under the financing provision? Uh, but if we do have serious allegations, what does it take to reopen a file? On our side, I will quickly say that when the where the audit is concerned, we can reopen files, and we have done that based on information that is public in the media. If we see something, then we can review the audit and we can provide information publicly on the results. But if nothing comes out of the audit initially, I don't transmit anything to the commissioner. I know that you can't share the information with us, but it could be that you are reviewing and investigating certain files. I want to come back to the maximum penalties, on the one hand, 
there is the possibility in the case of an elected official that that member would lose their position. And so is that the ultimate penalty? Well, there is a whole range of penalties, and the commissioner can speak to this, but I think that the maximum penalty is about five years in prison, and certainly it could be the case that the, um, the member of parliament would lose his or her position. Are there measures taken to deal with foreign uh, interference from China or Russia, for example. Uh, where we're concerned, we try to protect our computer infrastructure as well as we can, working with the Canada security establishment, and we try to ensure that Canadians have the information that they need. We're interested in the information on the voting process to make sure that Canadians have all the accurate information. It doesn't concern us whether the information that is out there about a candidate is correct or not. Um, just so our witnesses know and the rest of the day, we'll just be going over slightly to make sure that we do get this round done and that we have the hour with our guests. Mr. Cooper, five minutes to you, followed by Mr. Gerritsen, before we uh, let them go. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioner Samard. With the greatest respect, I find it uh, astounding that in response to uh, the last question posed by Mr. Bertold, uh, you said that you had no uh, knowledge or understanding of the particulars of the free new complaints. Uh, you're appearing here on a matter relating to serious allegations of foreign interference. Elections Canada is essentially the body, your office, as commissioner to enforce the law. And it's, again, I'd submit unacceptable that you've come to this committee that ill-prepared. And uh, moving on, I will uh, ask uh, Everett you. Have you met with Katie Telford since 2019? Madam Chair, I've never met Ms. Telford. I have never met Katie Telford either. Have you met with any minister in the government since 2019? In my case, I came into my position in six months ago, and I have not met with any minister in that time. The previous commissioner, to your knowledge? I don't have any idea. Mr. Madam Chair, I do meet uh, the minister responsible for democratic uh, institutions, as I do meet opposition critics, and I've shared the invitation to uh, all parties to uh, hear from them concerns that they have and, and talk about some of the uh, uh, major priorities for our agency. Have you, I have have you, met. Okay, thank you for that. Have you met with any minister's office staff since 2019, to both of you? In the context of in, meeting in con the minister, he, uh, he or she is accompanied typically by, uh, by staff. But never staff independent of minister? No, never. Okay. Non plus. I haven't either. What about uh, security cleared uh, st staff or other officials of the Liberal Party of Canada? No, no. just the advisory committee in June uh, on behalf of pol political parties. I met with people then, but not otherwise. Through the advisory committee of political parties, Madam Chair, uh, and at that committee, uh, I have a standing invitation for the commissioner, but we meet regularly with senior executives from all parties. Okay. Well, then, thank you for that. I would uh, ask if you to if you'd be prepared to undertake to provide to this committee uh, dates and names of the ministers and ministers' office staff to to the degree that that is possible, uh, along with any liberal party staff or officials uh, that you have met with since 2019. 
we undertake that. Since presumably January 2019. Since January 2019. Sure. The, the minutes of the uh, meetings are on our website and membership is, is, is public, so there's no confidential Will you provide, I will provide, that provide to a the detailed chair. list to this committee? I, I will do that, Madam Chair. And although you had indicated that you did not meet with the Prime Minister or anyone of the PMO, will you go back and verify that as well? That will not be difficult. I've never okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Mr. Clairtold. Mr. Perrault, have you had any report regarding uh, uh, threats to the electoral process? No, not a report specifically, because my job is really to oversee the administration of uh, the election process. And yesterday I was surprised that Elections Canada was not on that working group to protect our election process and that looks at what information should be made public. So if I understand correctly, you are not. Well, in preparation for the elections, we meet with various partners so that everyone is clear about their roles we have that kind of communication, and we know if there is an issue, we know who should take charge of that and react. So the communication mechanisms are clearly established. So I understand that. It's not because we're not part of the group that we don't have a role to play in that. Well, you know better than anyone that elections... Uh, when there's something at the beginning of the election process and the election process goes on, it's too late to react. Well, that depends on the quality of the information. There is a whole range of types of information, and so it all depends on the quality of that information. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and um, through you, Madam Chair, to uh, Madame Simard and Mr. Perot, I want to thank you, um, notwithstanding some of the um, uh, unfortunate comments that have been shared around the table today, I want to thank you for the incredible work that you and Elections Canada do. The reality of the situation is, is that we live in one of the freest and open democracies in the world, and that's as a result, not uh, because of partisan uh, 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 members of parliament or politicians, but because of the incredible work that you do. And so on, in any capacity that I can, I apologize for some of the comments that have been expressed today, and I thank you for the incredible work that you do. Um, the I just want to recap so that I fully understand this, and please feel free just to answer with yes and no if, that, if, if I have it correctly. So CSIS will receive complaints. CSIS will assess those. And if required, if they feel necessary, then turn it over to the commissioner to further investigate and take action on. Is that correct? If I may, the, there will be a, an appearance by the by CSIS right after me, so I will let them go into that. But I receive complaints, thousands a year, and foreign interference is only one small part of that. I receive complaints directly or through my partners. And I will ask CSIS that question too, um, but so just to confirm, it is very, um, uh, it would be reasonably acceptable to assume that CSIS might get some information that they don't end up turning over to you because they don't deem it necessary to go to you. Correct. I mean, CSIS must receive a lot of information, but maybe that's a hypothetical and, and you do, would rather not answer it, I understand. I don't know the unknown. Uh, yeah, fair enough. And just to go back to Mr. Cooper's uh, question in the original, the first round, CSIS did not provide any information regarding this global report to Elections Canada, to you, Commissioner? As I explained, for good reasons, for legal in reasons, I can't share that information regard because of confidentiality. Um, Bill C-76, which came about in 2018, that significantly increased the powers for 
Elections Canada to look into and investigate foreign interference, correct? I just want to correct you. It's not Elections Canada, but it is the Commissioner of Canada Elections. And uh, as was mentioned, one of those powers is to summon testimony. Would you say that that is working? Is it, uh, has it improved the ability of the Commissioner of Canada Elections to do uh, your work? I would say that any in in any improvement is welcome, and for the future, it would be helpful to have additional administrative powers as well, because we have to look at all means to deal with such serious threats. I guess, you know, my, I won't direct this comment at uh, the witnesses, because they do an incredible job of being nonpartisan, Madam Chair, but I guess I would uh, just say in conclusion that perhaps it would be uh, beneficial for us to reflect on the fact that the Conservatives voted against Bill C-76 when that came before the House of Commons that gave those powers to the Commissioner uh, to be able to do the incredible work that they're doing on our behalf today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. That was very appreciated. So on behalf of PROC committee members, I would like to thank both of you for your time today.